Welcome. Uh, there's plenty of space up here in the front middle if you're interested to move in a little bit, get a little closer. This is uh, Eric Rose from Mozilla, and he's going to talk to you about Elasticsearch. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome to Elasticsearch, the missing intro. Uh, here's what I mean by that. This is the orientation that I wish somebody had given me when I was getting started with Elasticsearch. Uh, this is stuff that either isn't in the manual at all, or that's kind of spread scattershot over all the manual pages, so it's hard to pull it back together and get the, uh, get the main idea. We only have 30 minutes here, or 25 without questions, so uh, I want you to get the most bang for your buck. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to quote trivia at you. You can look that up. It's in the manual. What I'm going to do is run this like a seminar on the fundamentals of Elasticsearch. I'm going to show you what goes on inside Elasticsearch mechanically so that you're going to be able to derive the answers to your own questions after you leave. So who am I to attempt this? Well, in 2011, I was working on Mozilla's support site, and we were using Sphinx as our search engine, and we kind of hit our heads on it in a couple of ways. We were sick of re-indexing as a batch every 15 minutes, and uh, we wanted really good multi-language support since we internationalized into, or localized, I should say, into 80 different languages. So I led the team that transitioned us to ES. From there, I went on to a startup called Vodizen, where I used ES in a much different way. Um, we would pull in bits of your uh, Facebook friends and Twitter friends. We'd pull in names, addresses, the states they lived in, the countries they lived in, whatever we could get, and mash this kind of fuzzy contact info that was no doubt full of lies and inaccuracies against the 180 million U.S. registered voters and try to figure out which one of them most likely was identified with each pile of contact info. And we got that down to about 23 milliseconds with the aid of uh, giving Amazon a hell of a lot of money and uh, ES. When that startup got acquired, I moved back to Mozilla, where in addition to my day job doing static analysis on the Firefox code base, I do a lot of ES consulting. We have a lot of different projects at Mozilla that use ES. Uh, we have everything from the company phone book, which is very small and not challenging, to things like terabytes of Firefox crash reports that come in. I also maintain the Pi Elasticsearch library, which is a low-level Python interface to ES. Now, I don't know if anybody outside the authors of Elasticsearch can really claim to be an expert, but I got started pretty early with it, and I've had the chance to really make a lot of mistakes. Uh, I'm going to try to help you avoid most of them. Any luck. So let's start with the basics. What is ES good for? Obviously, it's good for full text search. How many of you uh, have ever thrown a query at ES? And then how many are here just because you're thinking about, oh, it might be fun? It's about half and half, maybe even a little bit more of the latter. Uh, fantastic at full text search, does multiple languages really well. Uh, I'm also continually impressed, though, with how good a general data store ES is. Um, now, these days, whenever I have a general data storage or retrieval problem, it's in the running, right along with the relational stores and uh, key value stores. Segwaying into that, big data, it doesn't do any transactions. So there's no lockstep synchronization across the nodes in an ES cluster. Also, there's no referential integrity enforced. As a result, ES parallelizes and distributes really, really well. And it scales to at least terabytes. And uh, I've put 280 gig in it and gotten those 20 millisecond response times fairly straightforwardly. Third, it's fantastic at faceting. And this is mostly due to the Lucene libraries that it sits on, which are infinitely tweakable and uh, academically impressive. Relational databases are pretty bad at faceting, typically. Uh, you can do a group by count query, but you have to do one per facet. So maybe one if you're faceting on color, another if you're faceting on price, and so on and so forth. I believe Python, uh, Postgres rather has a way around this now, but that's really bleeding edge stuff. And then finally, uh, geo queries. This is relatively new to ES, but it will happily do bounding box, uh, distance queries, and even really expensive polygon containment queries, which it will very nicely parallelize for you. All the parts of ES that aren't Lucene are largely a one-man show. Uh, Shay Bannon, who goes by Kimchi on IRC. And Shay writes the clustering and the JSON and everything else that isn't raw information retrieval. And although the docs that he and his team have written are extensive, ES is far more extensive. You can get the API out of the docs, but a lot of the practical perspective is still tied up in the author's head. Kind of tends to feel like this a lot of the time. So once you understand the data structures, fortunately, you can answer a lot of your questions about how to format your stored data and efficiently query it. So let's take a look at the shape of the data. 
In case you're unfamiliar with it, ES is a document store, kind of like a MongoDB sort of thing. Its documents uh, look and feel like JSON, and you access them over HTTP, so you can use curl, web browsers, and all your standard URL lib stuff or requests to talk to it. You can even put load balancers in front of it. Now let's talk about the conceptual data structure, the one that the API presents to you. At the first level, you have indices. And there's no structure or uh, schema information, they're just bags, kind of like the databases in a relational system. Now inside that, you have doc types. And doc types you can think of like tables or an OOP like a class. They do have schema attached to them. Now you might say, oh, I, I thought ES was schemaless, right? I thought I could just stick JSON in it and it would go. Well, you can, but what will happen is the first time it sees any new field in a document, it'll say, well, let me infer a type for that. If there's a three in it, I'll say that's an int field. And then if you try to put a string in it uh, in a new document later, it'll freak out and throw an error and you'll get unhappy surprises. So when you make your documents that go inside a doc type or really uh, are, uh, have a doc type or attached to a doc type, be sure to uh, express your schemas explicitly. Also, if you ex express them explicitly, they end up in your source code and you can kind of use them as documentation. You can think of the contents of a document like a hash table. It's very hash table-y. It may not be stored exactly like that, but uh, if you use that to reason with, you won't go too far wrong. Now, if you want to store a bunch of things that have vastly different shapes in one Elasticsearch instance, you can go ahead and make multiple doc types. No problem. In fact, ES is even happy to query across multiple doc types. So here's something to keep in mind if you have multiple doc types. If, uh, if your different document types, say, have a title field and both have a modification date, try to name those fields uh, the same across different doc types, and then it becomes easy to do a single query. And of course, you can have more than one index. That just works like you'd think it would. And ES is even happy to query across multiple indices, though it's a small performance hit. Go ahead and query across three or four or five, but maybe not across 5,000. Now let's talk about the uh, documents. Documents have IDs, and you can think of these like the primary keys in a relational system. They end up in the URLs in the API. So if uh, a common pattern is to keep all your data wherever it is in MySQL or Postgres or whatever, and then kind of batch index it into Elasticsearch to get started, and then leave it in MySQL as the canonical data store. You don't have to rewrite all your code. Now, I advise you to uh, take that primary key from your original data store and go ahead and use it as your document ID in Elasticsearch. You'll be glad you did because otherwise Elasticsearch will make really ugly document IDs for you, these GU IDs, and you'll have to put them somewhere and they're enormous and they're unmemorable. So don't do that. Now let's start to explore full text search. This is where things really get interesting. It's easy to look at the ES query docs and wonder, well, how fast will this go? How can I tell? But if you understand the data structures, you can reason that out. How does full text searching of documents work? It's actually surprisingly straightforward. It just does pretty much exactly what you would do if someone locked you in a room with a pencil and made you do it by hand. Think about concordances. Who's ever used a concordance in here? So not too many, uh, and they've gone out of style for uh, obvious reasons. They were very, very expensive to construct. I'm sure there's a monk in the back room somewhere figuring out which pages Dwal occurred on in some book and then writing those down next to Dwal. And you can see how, how trivial it would be to work that backwards and say, well, which pages does Dwal work, uh, occur on? Well, these two. Now, a full in text index is just like this, but instead of page numbers, it uses document numbers. Here we can see which documents the word row is in, documents 0, 1, and 3. So down at the bottom, this represents our index, and we list 0, 1, and 3 next to the word row. Similarly, here are the docs that boat is in, 0 and 1. So in our index, we have boat point to 0 and 1. And chicken is only in document 2, so chicken points to just 2. Now that we've built up this index, called an inverted index, it's trivial to do these full text searches on those three words. So let's try a few. Now let's just look, just look at the bottom here, just at our index, and try to figure out which documents contain the word boat. So who thinks document zero contains the word boat? Yep, how about document one? How about two? 
Wrong. Okay, very good. So let's try something a little bit harder. Which docs contain the word row or the word boat? Zero? One? Two? Three? Good. Just keep it away. That's good. And then you can also see how you could do which contain both. Zero and one. You just take the intersection of those two sets. So you can imagine giving each document a point for each search term that it contains, and that would give you a basic scoring algorithm. And this is roughly what ES does, although it does a couple other fancy Lucini things, like it says, uh, well, you know, chicken is a very rare word in your corpus, so if you match chicken, well, that's kind of a rare gem, so we'll give you extra points for that. Now let's try something a little bit trickier. Let's try a phrase match. Let me find these words in exactly this order. How would we use this index to search for the phrase rowboat? You can't do it. The best we could do is to see that only documents 0 and 1 contain those words at all, and then we'd have to scan through those documents, which, who knows, maybe they're 6 meg documents, right? So let's make our index finer grained. So what we had before is in the yellow column on the left, and the new stuff is on the right. Next to each document number, now we keep track of the position where each of these words occurs. In other words, like the word numbers. So for the first line, this means that the word row occurs in document zero in positions zero, one, and two. Row, 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 your boat. So now we can use this to search for the phrase rowboat. First of all, we can eliminate any document that doesn't contain both words, right? Okay, so the red ones are still under consideration. Then all we have to do is examine the positions array. So we'll start with document zero. Row occurs there in positions zero, one, and two. So to match the phrase, boat would have to occur in one, two, or three. Just kind of offset by one. Does it? No, it does not. It occurs only in position four. So um, document zero is out of consideration. Meanwhile, maybe in another CPU, we could be examining document number one. And row occurs there in positions zero and two. So boat would have to be in one or three. And does it occur there? Why, yes, it does. So therefore, just by looking at the index, we know that document one contains the phrase rowboat. We didn't even have to look at the original text. So this is called, again, an inverted index, and this is what ES uses on all of your text fields. So the proceeding was all based on breaking documents down into words, which assumes we know how to do that. We glossed over how that's done. And this is a subject in itself known as analysis. Now, analysis breaks down text into words, or more generically, into terms. That's the vocab word for you, terms. Because after all, we might not always want to break on word boundaries, hyphens and spaces and such. ES comes with several analyzers that know how to do this in various ways. Here I've taken each of the stock analyzers, original white space, standard, etc., and applied them to an English sentence. And notice the differences here. First of all, you can see that uh, certain analyzers have stripped out what we call stop words, words that don't have a lot of semantic significance because they're just overly common, like the and at in this case. Second, uh, some of them stem words. For example, they've extracted the roots of words, so gerbils becomes a gerbil in the last line. Also, orange turned into orang, which is really ape-like orange, strange. And then punctuation. Uh, most of these strip the number sign off, for example. They've stripped the period off the end of the sentence. And finally, they've done case folding, mashing everything down to lowercase. Uppercase would have been fine, too. It doesn't matter. Uh, the snowball one, this last one, this last analyzer, is particularly worthy of mention. It's got uh, built-in support for stemming 22 different languages. It's got stop words for a lot of them. You don't have to bring your own stop word lists. And it's where I go first for bodies of prose. Good, good first step. Though, as you can see, it's not perfect with the uh, orang. The Analyze API is really handy for seeing what the results of the analyzers will be, for kind of auditioning them. And that's how I built that last slide. I just ran this, I said which analyzer I wanted, and that first bold thing. And then I took a look at the token keys and the result. So to use a particular analyzer, you just specify it in your mapping. And a mapping is that schema I talked about that doc types have. Uh, I didn't give you the entire, entire big crazy hash for doing that, but you can pull that out of the docs. This is just the, the interesting segment where we choose an analyzer for a specific field, the address field in this case of a document. Analyzers are made out of three stages. They kind of flow one stage into the next like a pipeline. Got char filters, tokenizers, and token filters. 
Uh, char filters are just what they sound like. They manipulate a raw stream of characters coming through, and the only two char filters out of the box are ones that remove the HTML elephant elements, elephants also, and replace specified combinations of characters with other ones. So you could like replace PH with F if you wanted to, and uh, make a poor man's phonetic key maybe. Uh, second stage, the tokenizer, that picks how to divide text up into words or terms. For example, the letter tokenizer breaks the text on anything that is not a letter. So something like uh, a name like O'Brien, O apostrophe Brian, uh, would turn into two terms with a letter analyzer, O and Brian. And then finally, the token filter at the end, this is the most interesting part, this is where all the magic happens. It does uh, stemming and removing stop words. And then finally, at the end, out pop the terms, and the terms turn into those words in the index, in the inverted index we already looked at. So uh, the stock analyzers are prepackaged combinations. It's kind of like a choosing from columns at a Chinese restaurant or something. You choose some chart filters, some tokenizers, some token filters, and you get these pre-built bundles out of the box. But you can also build your own by choosing an implementation of each. For example, this is a settings excerpt which defines a custom analyzer called name analyzer, and then you can reuse that throughout your schemas. It doesn't use a char filter, so we don't see the words char filter. For a tokenizer, it uses one built on a custom regex down at the bottom, which divides the terms on anything but letters and apostrophes. So, uh, for example, O'Brien in this case would, let me get this right, it divides terms on anything but letters and apostrophes. Right, so apostrophes are included, O'Brien is one term. And then it uses the token filter, which turns everything into lowercase, so your searches can be case insensitive. Now this analyzer also splits hyphenated names into two different words, to two terms, so that queries that have both halves of the name but maybe don't put a hyphen between them can still match. Now, so far, I've uh, talked about analyzers merely for indexing things. But there's another time when analyzers are used. They're used at query time. So when you, say, put a string in a search box someplace, uh, pretend it's on Google, and you type it in, in uppercase, by default, the same analyzer that happens at index time also happens to your query. So your query will be folded, say, to lowercase and split up maybe into O and Brian. And then uh, you can see how it would be much simpler to match that lowercase i split up version against the static data in your index. Now there are certain uh, instances where it's helpful to be able to control and choose a different analyzer at query time than at index time. One of those is when you deal with synonyms. Synonyms are handled by a special kind of token filter. When it sees one word, it replaces it with another one or lots of different words. Now, you can't change synonym lists of the index analyzer on the fly because uh, if you think about it, it would have to go over the whole corpus again and uh, recompute an index for all of your documents. It'd take forever. But you can change the synonym list of your query analyzer because after all, there's no you know, document corpus that's bound to. It just happens dynamically. So if we do something like this, mapping Albert to Albert and Al, and Alan to Alan and Al, we can do searches like this for Alan Smith, and that turns effectively into a query for Alan or Al Smith. Those two words, that notation there, means that Alan and Al are both superimposed on position zero in the index. It's okay, they can overlap, it's perfectly happy to deal with those superpositions. And likewise, if you search for Albert Smith, it would search really for Albert or Al Smith. So you always find what you're looking for. Now I like to set up my query side synonym mappings using the update settings API, which is a departure from what the docs recommend. They recommend putting everything in a config file on the server, which uh, is a, kind of a drag. And then you need to kind of puppet that out to all your servers. Fine, you need to do that anyway for your real config file. But uh, you also have to then restart the server so that they pick it up. And nobody likes to do that. Why do that, right? Use update settings. So now that we know and are comfortable with the index data structures, let's talk about how to get data out of them efficiently. The best way by far to query ES is via JSON. Uh, this is called the query DSL, and here's kind of an example query, medium-sized. Now ES also understands Lucene-style textual queries. Who's familiar with the Lucene-style queries that kind of have like capital knots in them and stuff? I don't really know them very well. 
Uh, the trouble with exposing those via your application is that a parse error, parsing a query, kind of explodes and throws ugly errors, and you don't know what to, uh, what to feed your users then. And they can only express a small subset of what the JSON queries can. So the JSON queries, though, are basically ASTs, abstract syntax trees. They're cumbersome to build by hand, and they're not terrifically easy to read, but on the other hand, they are immensely powerful and easy to build programmatically. In fact, there are several libs that are really good at making them easy to build, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. The documentation around the query syntax is among the most comprehensive in all the ES manuals, so I'm not going to sit here and read all that to you. You can, you can do that. But I do want to cover some bumpy ground that is almost guaranteed to trip up newcomers. They call it the query DSL, but really there are two constructs that can go into it. Filters and queries. Two things called query. Great idea, right? So it's important to understand the difference between these two constructs because picking the wrong one will kill your performance. First, filters are Boolean. They either match a doc or they don't. There's nothing in between. There's no ranking or scoring. Queries, on the other hand, score and rank each doc. So they can match a doc more than another doc. Now, because they don't have to do any ranking, filters are an order of magnitude faster. So filter when you can, query when you must. What's more, filters are automatically cached. So if you use the same type of filter with the same parameters, it'll go crazy fast the second and following times. And here's a really fun thing about the caches ES does. They don't get invalidated at the drop of a hat like most caches do. Instead, they get updated as the index changes. So if I filtered for uh, all of my blog posts whose category field says rant, and then I make a new rant, uh, that filter cache, which is stored as a bitmap internally, will be actually updated to take the new doc into account. And then if memory gets full, these things get evicted in least recently used fashion, as you might imagine. So anything that you can imagine doing by hand with the uh, index data structures we've already talked about, you can do with a query DSL. For example, uh, some common patterns include using a filtered query. This is a specific kind of query, and here's one of these. It combines some filters with some queries, kind of in a uh, one pipe into the another fashion. The filters winnow down the set of considered documents, just like we did, and then the queries uh, further winnow them down and then rank the remainder. This is about the most realistic uh, example I could fit on a slide. They can get really long. They can fill up a page of your editor, no problem. Um, I'll just kind of walk you through this one. So the second line, the second operative line here says filtered. That says, oh, this is a filtered query. So if you looked in the documentation under filtered query, it would say, well, these have a filter and a query. And you can see those as the next set of keys within there. Uh, the, the inside of the filter is a term query, which says the field category should contain rants. Meanwhile, in query, we have a, a Boolean query here, and uh, Boolean queries are maybe even overkill for this, but one of the things that they can do is say, well, this query should match and this query should match. And what that means is that a document won't necessarily be excluded because it doesn't match, but it will get a nice score bonus if it does match. This illustrates another pattern here. We have a match phrase, a phrase match, and then a normal match, which is just the more of these words that are in there, the better. And I'm doing both of them. And they're both working together to build my final score. Uh, you, can, you can think about why this might be nice. So if I, if I Google, say, for Fix Your Little Red Wagon, I would expect the top hits to be Fix Your Little Red Wagon. And then as we move down the results, maybe some of them just say Fix My Wagon, for example. This way, we're sure to catch anything that has all the words, but we give a nice uh, ranking bump to the ones that have the exact phrase. Now, let's talk about how to do this from Python. PyES was one of the first libraries for getting at ES. Um, now, I, have, I used it for a while. It was fine. But I have a couple of, uh, couple of objections to it. It can't really decide what level of abstraction that it wants to operate at. It does weird things, like have no op lines in the code. And uh, it does socket calls from destructors. So if you have circular data structures somehow with an ES object, you never know when you're going to actually do your bulk indexing. And the code is kind of Byzantine and hard to read, especially the connection handling and failover code, which should be most auditable. So I don't recommend that. Instead, I like uh, PyElasticSearch right now. I voted as we needed a more reliable client. And I found this one lying around and essentially rewrote the thing uh, so that it would uh, have more solid connection pooling, uh, better load balancing, and so that it would say, well, that, that node timed out when I uh, tried to make a query to it. I'm going to put that in a penalty box for five minutes and not try to query it anymore. 
I also made the uh, API a lot more consistent and improved error handling. So if you ever get a, you know, a bad HTTP code back from ES, it'll be sure to raise an exception. You won't just swallow that. Uh, it's fairly low level. It has methods for each of the ES API calls, but you do construct, uh, you have to construct the dict equivalent of JSON yourself. So while it's my favorite choice for complex queries, if you want to start mucking around with something like custom scoring, but if you want to do something simpler, maybe combine kind of Venn diagram-y sets of things like uh, Django's ORM does, you might want to take a look at Elastic Utils. This is a higher level library built on PyElasticSearch, so you get all that load balancing stuff for free. And uh, it gives you kind of a Django chainable ORM-y kind of flavor to your API. It's shorter, terser, but it's kind of hard to translate sometimes between that and then looking at all the JSON on the ES document pages. Also it gives you uh, kind of more convenient object-oriented ways of getting your results. So is the abstraction worth it? It depends on where you're coming from. If, you're, if you uh, don't know anything, if you're coming into it fresh and you, uh, you have to learn one API or the other, ES or uh, you know, Elastic Utils, uh, so you know, choose which one you like better. But if you already know ES, maybe just uh, go with PyElastic Search and don't have to learn an additional API. Now remember, you also have to learn a little bit of the ES API so you can read the documentation. And then finally, there's uh, Django Haystack. I don't know too much about this, but one of the cool things, uh, it's kind of Django ORM-y, but it also has pluggable backends. You can stick it against uh, Solar and a couple of other different engines. Uh, maybe we're out of time, unfortunately. I hope this has given you a really good taste of the ES internals, and I hope you uh, find uses for them, and your new understanding helps you avoid my past mistakes. Thanks so much for coming. If you uh, have any questions, you can come up to the microphone. We've got just a couple minutes left. Or you can raise your hand and I'll run over to you. And part two me. of this talk will be on Sunday, uh, 110. We'll be talking about clustering, replication, sharding, deployment, general maintenance concerns, monitoring, all that good, good stuff. Oh, somebody's got query questions. Come on. All right. Well, uh, um, I'll ask on a moment. Um, with the PyElastic Search library being so low level, do you actually get much out of it as opposed to just using, say, requests and, and using it as a JSON web service? It uses, uh, so the question is, uh, if PyElastic Search is so low level, what do you get out of it uh, compared to, say, just requests? And requests is great. I use requests in PyElastic Search. It handles the pooling. Uh, what it gives you in addition is uh, something I think is very important, which is errors that are hard to accidentally swallow. You get a bad res response code back, it'll go kaboom. Uh, I have kind of nice exceptions that let you catch uh, things like, oh, the index wasn't there at all, and distinguish that from like a 500 error that uh, bad things are going on. And then the uh, failed node penalty box thing is another important bit. Hello. Uh, I realize that there's a lot of variables here, but I'm wondering if you'd be brave enough to throw out a number in terms of indexing speed transactions that you think is decent numbers you've seen with Elasticsearch. So the question so that is, if I'm working a... with Elasticsearch, and my, how I might know my numbers are way off, that something's wrong with my configuration. When would you look at a search cluster and say, So that's what's a broken? reasonable indexing speed? And uh, 1,000 documents a second is a perfectly reasonable indexing speed for a cluster of eight nodes uh, feed with one Python process feeding them. Okay. Uh, typically, ES will, will happily outrun your Python processes. Typically, you need to run just short of one Python per ES node. A lot of variables here. I'll talk about that in part two a lot. Right, thank you. Uh, very good talk. Uh, is it is it possible to uh, like give weightage to like certain terms? Like say, for instance, whenever I type in R, like my query contains R, like have the row bought as the first query. Uh, like how how hard or easy is it to like boost uh, like certain results? Uh, so it's a boosting question, but I didn't quite get the specifics. What do you want to boost up? Uh, it might it might be like certain like say uh, these ten results should always be at the top. Ah, so the uh, question is well, I have I'm kind of doing a manual audit of my search results and I, I put in little red wagon and my little red wagon document isn't coming up to the top. How can I force it up to the top? Is that easy or not? <sighs> so there are two ways to go at this. I mean you can make or make it a requirement that this document will be at the top and try to you know, handle it with if-thens in your app logic or a separate step, which is you know, what you have to do if people just don't understand. Uh, but ideally, you're reasonable and you can solve it alg algorithmically, and so you don't have to keep on manually chasing all these down. Um, one of the approaches to this, 
uh, well, one of the approaches is obviously the match phrase thing. Mix that into your uh, query someplace. And the other approach is quasi-manual. If you have people who just won't leave you alone about this or you really want to be able to kind of influence things, you can make like a keywords field. Throw stuff in there, query against that while you're querying against the full text, and uh, really just boost the heck out of it. I know this could be a talk in and of itself, but maybe you could say why you chose Elasticsearch over other search engines. I'm trying to audit some for my app, so Ooh. I'm just kind of curious if my, maybe a couple sentences. Thank you. So, Solar, think of another one and say it, and I can address Whoosh that. Sure, you know, something like well, that. Now, Woosh, I don't know. I'm going to go to the Woosh talk later on. That's sure. uh, fascinating to me. And Woosh reminds. Sphinx, okay, well, Sphinx, I said. <laughs> Sphinx didn't support uh, incremental indexing when I got off of it. It does now. Um, it also, I think you can really only put integers into it. Um, it's been a long time since I used Sphinx. Comparing Elasticsearch to Solar, now Solar 4.0 has clustering, but 3x did not, so that was a big thing while that lasted. Uh, ES is still easier to configure, I believe. It's very easy to build up a cluster. A little harder to build it up well. Uh, the JSON querying is nice. I like that a lot. Uh, whoosh. Whoosh reminds me of uh, Zcatalog back in my Zope days. It was a Python implementation of an inverted uh, text index. And uh, I suppose speed would be a major, major thing there. Now, now put uh, PyPy around it and we'll see. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much. If you have more questions, it'll be somewhere else. Right there. Right there. <laughs> All right. And actually, Whoosh is our next talk. So. Stay Brilliant. tuned.